comes up. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to um, all of you viewers who follows us on Arts USM Facebook. Thank you for joining us in our afternoon program, uh, a webinar uh, entitled uh, Under the Premise of Research In. Okay. Today, uh, in School of the Arts, we do a lot of research and we usually engage other researchers as well to speak, uh, not only to our staffs, but here on Facebook Live our the, the invited researchers and uh, presenters can be able to present their work as well in public as well. So I would like to thank all of you for being here and I would like to introduce uh, our moderator today Dr. Pravida Monoharan who is our current head of department uh, of music uh, uh, from the music department and also our most welcome presenter uh, researcher from uh, Dr. Adil Johan from University of Bangsa in Malaysia who has you know, uh, graciously accepted our invitation to share his work, to, to share his latest work uh, today in the, in the context of a very interesting title, which is Rock Kappa. So I'm not going to dwell on it anymore. So I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Pravina instead to do the proper in the introduction of Dr. Adil. Okay, the floor is all yours now, Dr. Pravina, and later Dr. Adil. Enjoy, enjoy the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Sarina, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our Research In Talk. Um, today's session is by a musician and also a researcher. So Dr. Adil Johan is a research fellow at the Institute of Ethnic Studies at UKM. He did his PhD at King's College London. And in researching aspects of popular culture and media, in the Malay world and Southeast Asia. He has published the book, Cosmopolitan Intimacies, Malay Film Music of the Independence Era. Um, he also recently co-edited Made in Nusantara, Studies in Popular Music, which compiles new research written by scholars based in the region. Um, he also performs and records as a saxophonist for Azmil Yunus Okis, Padu and Nadir. Um, he's also recently collaborated with Cultural Economic Development Agency's Chandana to produce Malaysia's first Klang Valley independent music ecosystem map. And um, he is actually quite active in the music field and also in the research field. So without further ado, I would give the floor to Dr. Adil to talk to us today about a very interesting um, genre during the 1980s and the 90s, which was a very popular Malay rock genre. So I'll let him talk to us about it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bravina, for that very kind and generous introduction. I'm going to share my screen here with the uh, obligatory PowerPoint uh, for presentation. So yes, uh, today's topic is uh, about what I initially uh, sent to Dr. Bravina and Dr. Serena was um, the title had the word uh, rock kappa, yeah, rock kappa phenomenon of the 1980s and 1990s. However, as I spent a, like about a month of like doing more research, I came to a kind of I came to the information that rock kappa is probably not the best term for us to use for this genre of music. And I'll 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 start off with explaining why very early on in my talk. Um, and before I start, I may want to say uh, Salam Nusantara, Salam Sejahtera, Samikom. And, you know, have, I'm so happy to be here digitally and so happy also to be so happy to be um, digitally in Penang, which is actually my hometown. Like, actually, you know, I actually grew up going to USM a lot as a kid. I also played in a USM jazz band a very long time ago when I was a teenager. But anyway, so yeah, let's get on to the presentation. So. For today, uh, I'm going to start off with talking a little bit about uh, rock kappa and why we shouldn't call it rock kappa. Um, then I'm going to give you a little visual history of Malaysian popular music with a little bit of music from the band that's being featured, Search. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what Nusantara means because I, I kind of put Nusantara in the title, right, for the talk. And then finally, um, and then towards the end, I'll talk about the phenomenon, the phenomenon of Search, of the Malaysian band Search. Um, across borders, yeah? 
and I'll give you some conclusions. And because, you know, I can't speak enough by way of an epilogue, we'll talk a little bit about how this research is actually, most of it is actually historical research that's very much focused on the 1980s and 1990s only. However, but I'll try to talk a little bit about the implications and the impact of um, rock from the Malay world in present day. Yeah? So let's get into it and uh, rock on, yeah? So um, hold on to your seats. Uh, it's going to be a rocking ride. Um, and excuse my horrible puns that will be, be littered throughout this talk. I am a dad and apparently I love these puns. So anyways, let's get to it. So what is rock kapak? So first is, we, can't, we shouldn't call it kapak actually, um, based on research that I've done. It's probably not the best idea. However, the term will still be relevant because people are still using this term, right, uh, in popular culture. There, is, um, there are five theories as to where the term rock kapak came from. And I'm completely sangat uh, berterima kasih kepada uh, Dr. Taki Yudin Hassan, uh, so indebted to Dr. Taki Taki Yudin is actually um, a social scientist in UKM, in a Faculty of Social Sciences. And he's actually embarked on this amazing ethnographic project on Malay rock. Uh, in Malaysia, and he's, I'm really excited to, to see his book that will come out, I think, in the near future. But I want to direct you guys, everyone, to his Facebook site, which is a wealth of blog posts and knowledge about all the work that he's do been doing on Rock Kappa. And mind you also, he's actually not like a music scholar, he's a political scientist and social scientist, but he is actually a fan of, of the Malay rock, uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s towards the 90s. So I think his insights are actually very important. And he's also talked to a lot of people in the, who are artists and fans of the music. First theory is the word kapak. Okay, a lot of Malay rock from that era was played in, in uh, shows which occupied kapaks. Um, and this also included uh, fun fairs and uh, all these little fun fair festivals. In fact, there's a tapak pesta in Sungai Nibong, just uh, very close to uh, uh, USM where there, there were a lot of performances as well. In fact, there were some historical performances in the Sungai Nibong uh, tapak pesta where you know, chairs were thrown and police was called in and that created quite a, quite a fuss. This was uh, sometime in the late 80s. In fact, our distinguished professor Tan Sui Bing of Pustat Seni actually wrote about it in both Aliran and also in her article, which I cite generously, generously in my work. So kapak, yeah, first theory. Theory number two, kapak kepala bit, which um, in English means, whoa, that's mind-blowing or awesome. It's like your head is, is axed. So apparently there was a slang that was used uh, by Malay rock fans from that era um, when they experienced a, a really good performance. Uh, Persembahan yang mantap. As uh, Dr. Taki says. And the other one, of course, kapa in Malay literally translates to axe. And for those of you who are fans of rock um, and jazz, um, axe is also a term that's used for your guitar or your instrument. Yes, and this is used across the world. And it's a very it's a very um, Anglo-American thing, but apparently we adopted it as well. Yeah, kapa axe for guitar. Uh, Kapak Besila, and this is the most interesting insight from Dr. Taki, is that back then um, there were these pirate cassettes, which is a big issue back then. Huh? All these bands were producing albums, but people, of course, you, if you can't afford them, you have to buy the pirated cassette, yeah, the bootleg cassettes, for those of you uh, who are not from Malaysia. Um, and these bootleg cassettes, these pirate cassettes, had a symbol of, of cross axis, Kapak Besilang. So apparently, a lot of these bands you know, uh, you get a lot of these cassettes and that would be the symbol there. So maybe this was one of the et etymological uh, origins of kapa. And this is the one that as, as, a, as a musicologist, ethnomusicologist, um, I like this theory a lot. Um, I don't know, of course, it, you know, we, don't, we, we still can't verify which one is true, but it's the sound of the snare, the do, do, pa, do, do, pa, you know, like that pa sound, which is so characteristic of, Malay rock and, and all these rock ballads where that snare in itself, I mean, those of you who are doing uh, popular music recording, snare in itself is kind of like gets its own track, right? In a DAW or in a, in a recording. So yeah, these are the five theories as to the origins of the word rock kapak, okay? Which I will fully attribute to Dr. Taki Taki Yudin, yeah? Please check out his Facebook page. However, he also elaborates that rock is rock, you know, this is what fans and musicians of that music, you know, say. So why, why don't use rock kappa? Because artists and fans from the era actually just see that music as rock or, you know, 
and I'll, I'll tell you the term that I want to use. Um, the term that I want to use actually for my research, which I feel is the best kind of compromise. There's no perfect term for any genre as unless of course the fans themselves and the musicians themselves have developed it. For me, for studying this genre of music, I'm going to call it Malay rock only because of a pragmatic uh, use of it because a lot of, well, the songs are in Malay, in the Malay language. But the Malay language also allows for it to be distributed across the Nusantara world or maritime Southeast Asia, um, across the Malay speaking regions of the Nusantara, which includes um, many parts of Indonesia, of course, Singapore, Brunei, um, and, and maybe even some parts of the Philippines as well that speak Malay. However, um, my research right now is more concentrated on Malaysia, Indonesia kind of relationships. Singapore is always there. You know, Singapore is very crucial to the Malaysian uh, and the Malay world popular music industry. And Brunei also features as well. In fact, there's, some, there's, there's, some, there's a really good study on Brunei and heavy metal. But for today, Nusantara will encompass uh, Indonesia and Malaysia and a bit of Singapore. Um, the ethno-national politics of identi identity. Um, for those of you who are in Malaysia, I mean, I mean, in, in, in our politics, race is uh, a, a major feature. Um, and the fact that there were so many Malay youth uh, involved in this actually created a lot of anxiety with the Malaysian state, which is, you know, a Malay majority led uh, state and also conservative at that. So we're going to get into a little bit of these issues of ethno politics, uh, ethno national politics. Yeah. So Malay rock is the term. So there's, like I said, there's this contestation and control uh, between the Malay youth and the state. The state wanted to control the youth. The youth, you know, weren't necessarily political, but they were, they were charting um, a new kind of culture that was deviant and different from the established conservative culture of the Malay Malaysian state. So Malay is very much a, a feature, a common feature, both uh, music, more, more like linguistically, um, and also musically as well. There are elements of Malay music in there, but I would say more so linguistically and culturally. Um, uh, that is why I use the term Malay rock. So from now on, we're going to get rid of rock kappa and we're going to throw the kappa in the bin. Okay. And we're just going to use the term Malay rock yeah, for the rest of this uh, presentation. Okay. The other thing that we want to talk about is back then, in the 1980s, uh, especially in the mid 1980s onwards, there was the emergence of Kutu rock subculture. It has a lot to do with hair. Those of you who speak Malay know that Kutu um, actually means hair lice, you know, um, and young, the young Malay youth, most of them male, a lot of whom had emigrate, um, immigrated from the rural areas and the peripheries to the cities, yeah, to the urban centers in Malaysia. Were, we were part of this new working class of youth uh, that were that were something that they called kutus. And they, of course, like really embraced the rock culture, you know, and they fashioned themselves that way. However, politicians, uh, specifically Malay politicians that ruled the country in the 1980s and 1990s, had, you know, some words to say, la, and they were quite uh, worried about it. So this politician said heavy metal, and that applies to the music that we're talking about, Malay rock. It's a subculture that is a negative attempt to change Malay norms and values. We worry about the kutus. They have taken on traits that are bad. Young men wearing earrings, clothes that are dirty, unruly hair, such behavior leaves an indelible impression. And we are worried that when these young people get older, they will not be in a position to be responsible to run the country. So of course, politicians, they use this rhetoric that, yeah, the youth are the future, but you know, they want the youth to be molded in the same way that allows them to control these youth, right? Under their own institutions. And guess who said this? Najib Razak, yeah? Um, I mean, those of us in Malaysia know that he is a former prime minister of Malaysia, um, but a lot of us also know that this is probably one of the most controversial prime ministers of Malaysia who was involved in, uh, who has been involved in currently in a court, court cases uh, for corruption involved with the 1MDB scandal and not. So hashtag hypocrisy, maybe, I don't know, but you know, back then maybe he was a budding young minister that was really trying to do right by the country. But this is a position that conservative Malay, Malaysian politicians take on rock culture. So let's talk a bit about music, yeah? 
So we're going to talk a bit now about the musical influences and the stylistic influences. When I say style, I'm talking about genre, like the kind of instrumentation that's used. Uh, I think the instruments, right? Are they using saxophones? No, not really. They're using guitars, drums, bass. You know, what are the, also the, the fashion styles? You know, because that fashion, the fashioning of, of popular music culture is very important. It's a very important part of the genre of that music as well. We're going to look at the global influence of glam slash hair metal. Um, this genre of metal, heavy metal, was also called light metal in a more derogatory way from people from other genres of metal. Um, and then we're also going to look at, at this. This is a kind of genre of metal that I grew up on, speed trash metal. Okay. Um, here are the important, some, I mean, these are not all, it's not comprehensive. So please don't, you know, come and find me and say, hey, why you didn't include this band? But these are the, for those of you who are not um, exposed to heavy metal culture and music, these are the important bands, you know, these are the major influences uh, on Malaysian rock or Malay rock. Scorpions, right? The band from Germany that has a very famous song that you always hear in weddings and, and karaoke centers, Winds of Change, right? That's a very important song from Scorpions. Def Leppard, really love this band as well. This is Eddie Van Halen, known for his virtuosic guitar playing uh, and really kind of an icon for glam metal, actually. And very important band for Malay rock is actually the Japanese band Loudness, which, was, which also uh, was a huge and popular band in the States uh, back in the 80s, you know, and they remained that way as well. But they were like especially popular in Malaysia, I think because they represented like an Asian... Uh, an Asian band that, it, that was able to gain recognition overseas, you know. And a lot of Malay rock fans are huge loudness fans. In fact, it's, like, I remember reading in Taki's uh, Facebook, it's like, it's like, haram kalau tak kenal loudness. You know, it's like, it's, it's forbidden, you know, if you do not, like you are like cursed, if you do not know who loudness is and you say you're a Malay rock fan, right? So, Trash metal, this is the kind of genre. It, trash metal came a little bit uh, simultaneously, but a little bit later, their, their music was... Oh, sorry, let's talk about the music. So, of course, glam metal, you can see by the style. They use bright colors. Uh, they have long hair. You know, hair is kind of a feature. That's why they call it hair metal. It's characterized by very upbeat uh, commercial songs. There's a mix of heaviness, you know, with the distorted guitars. But there were a lot of these bands also known for their ballads. And I will talk a little bit about this genre of this formula of the power ballad, uh, which were characteristic of these songs. And these songs allowed them to appeal to both male and female audiences and wider audiences as well. Now, trash metal kind of turns that on its head and introduces faster tempos, uh, more distortion, uh, and darker themes uh, in the lyrics. Uh, this is the band Anthrax. Well, they're already named after a, a biological weapon. Uh, so you can see the themes, right, that they're going through. This is Slayer. And you can see the themes of the names also are a bit more um, aggressive, right? Slayer, a really good band, though. Sepultra, this is one of my favorite bands as a teenager growing up listening to. Very influential to not only the Malay rock scene, but the underground uh, rock and heavy metal scene in Malaysia. And of course, I mean, you kind of, it's kind of hard. I mean, if you're a student of music, I mean, you got to know Metallica. La. Metallica. La. <laughs> no, it's actually it's Metallica. You got to know Metallica. Um, and for a lot of Malay rock fans, Metallica is like, a lot of them will know the song Fade to Black. It's, a, it's, it's one of their rare ballad songs, you know, for a heavy metal band. But yeah, these are the global influences. You can ask me more questions about this later. Let's have a look at um, some Malay rock bands from the era. Um, this is um, a CD reissue of a 1986 album, a compilation, uh, produced by this company called Box Office Malaysia. Um, and it was actually um, a Battle of the Bands competition. If you're a Malay rock fan, you'll probably know this event very well. And you can see some very prominent um, Malay rock bands here, like Ella and the Boys, Left Handed, Bloodshed, SYJ or Sophia, Rahim Matrof and White Steel. You can see the style, right? Look at the hair, look at the, the pants, look at the colors, right, of what they're wearing. And that's really part of this glam metal kind of style. However, um, some observers of uh, Malay rock have also said that there's this combination between speed metal and stylistically, um, at least in fashion, speed metal and, and glam. So glam had more outrageous flamboyant colors, but speed metal had more like masculine, darker things. And they also like to wear a chain um, uh, around on your pants. I used to have this like wallet chain as well, right? That you would have. 
and a lot of speed metal people adopt that style and and uh, where glam metal a lot of glam metal bands wear like fancy like leather shoes or boots uh, malay rockers who wore sneakers of course there's a combination of styles lah. but the sneaker was uh, the alif sneaker especially by worn by a lot of uh, search was uh, iconic for that era Here's another, uh, here's the second part of Battle of the Bands, you know, all released the same year. Also check out the, the imagery uh, painted uh, in the cover of this. It's very masculine, right? This is uh, Malay rock. Uh, but as you can see, uh, women, uh, young women were also part of the scene uh, as they're trying to show here in the scene. And of course, Ella, you know, is our queen of rock, you know, is, is the iconic figure uh, from that scene as well. So while it was, of course, while Malay rock was, was mostly... Um, listened to and experienced and played by men. I mean, women, young women also featured prom prominently as well. Okay, so now I was asked by Dr. Pravina uh, to give, because you know, there's so little information out there for everyone in Malaysia about Malaysian popular music and the history of it. I was asked to give um, a little bit of a context on what Malaysian popular music is. Um, and so I've decided to compile a kind of visual, uh, like a visual history, yeah? of Malay popular music um, through album covers, yeah? Album covers that I have actually been fortunate to collaborate with the Asia Culture Center in Gwangju, South Korea um, to collect uh, rare albums. I also worked with the Penang House of Music, shout out to Paul Augustine and team there as well. You know, you're technically, technically we are hosting, being hosted from Penang. Um, and yeah, this was a very important project. And I'm gonna give you a little like taste of, of what we did, but I'm going to give you a chronological, um, by no means comprehensive, it's not comprehensive, but it's just to give you a visual sense of what Malaysian popular music was like from 1965 specifically to 1991. Here we go. So we got in 1965, we've got Ahmad Daud, who's also from Penang, by the way. Um, um, and he, he, there was a, a, a um, film called Dendang Pontianak where, sorry, from the film called Pusaka Pontiana, where, where they actually, where he actually played a pop yeye -ye band. Huh? This is a Malay rock version, Malay rock and roll inspired by the Beatles and, and, uh, and the shadows of the, of the mid 1960s. You start to see the first introduction of rock uh, in Malay recorded music. Yeah? Uh, and of course, this was recorded in Singapore. Singapore is very crucial to the history of Malay and Malaysian music. And of course, Singapore was part of Malaysia once, right? Uh, in fact, there was a point when Malaysians only wanted to listen to, to Singaporean artists and music. And there was a point uh, in time, somewhere like during the 70s, when a lot of Malay language music was actually produced in Singapore by Singaporean producers as well. So this is an example of that. However, this is a very interesting case of a very important uh, Malaysian band, uh, the, the kind of like the, the, the key Malaysian pop yeye -ye band. A lot of the pop yeye -ye bands were based in Singapore, but this band, Orkest Nirwana, Nirwana uh, not Nirvana, but Orkest Nirwana, a lot of people don't know that these guys existed way before Nirvana, um, were very important pop yeye -ye band from Johor Bahru. Yeah, and you can see it all there. And this is an album from 1966, oh, I got the date wrong. Sorry, not 1965, 1966. Um, and um, the most important song from them that you got to know is Tak Mengapa. Okay, and it's produced by a company called Nifat Records. Okay. Next is the Agogo 67, 1967. Uh, Shaw Brothers, uh, the, the company that P. Ramli was uh, based in, um, produced a film about uh, rock and roll, about Malay rock and roll and youth culture called Agogo 67. So here's a, a LP, here's an EP from that, from that era, from the film. We're going to fast forward a little bit now to 1971. 1971, Art Radio Television Malaysia, or RTM, um, they like to host this competition, this singing competitions that feature Malaysians of all backgrounds, you know. And you'll notice uh, in 1971, Bakat TV, uh, this television broadcast program, a lot of the songs are actually uh, English songs uh, sung by Malaysians, okay. And uh, in between that, you have bands like The Strollers, um, who not only play uh, pop rock music, but they also do collaborate, you know, with, uh, uh, with companies like Nestle and Her World Magazine, as you can see here, to release special records, yeah, uh, that come with the magazines and whatnot. And this, this album was to, was to uh, promote Nestle Milk, but it was actually about new, the song that they were, that were pushing here was the song New Woman, which is 
one of their famous songs. You've got interesting cases of like uh, people who cover art, um, Western or Anglo-American artists. So Rocky Teo was uh, the Elvis of Malaysia. Um, I don't have a date for this because a lot of these records actually don't actually put the date. So I'm going to circa this at about 1970. So this is Rocky Teo, Malaysia's Elvis. Um, in 1970, oh, sorry, I didn't put the date here, but this album came out in 1973, which is about, or just before 1973, uh, which is about the same time that the national culture policy was uh, formed. So Malaysia was starting to push more towards promoting uh, arts and media that was more in line with national culture. And that national culture would be defined by predominantly Malay and Islamic characteristics. There's a lot of work uh, written by Tan Sui Beng about this, and I re highly recommend that you read them in your class. But let's move on, yeah? 1972, you start to see the impact of the national culture policy uh, on, on popular music, where you have a mix of Malay songs and English songs in Bakat TV. Uh, you can see on the left corner is like all these uh, Malay language songs. But on the right, you have English songs, you know. So imagine uh, Bakat TV as the X Factor or American Idol, Malaysian Idol of the 70s lah, back then, yeah. So we've got Rafia Buang, is actually coincidentally Singaporean, but she then became Malaysian uh, because uh, she was so popular here. It's a beautiful album cover. Um, you can see that the album is still this album or this EP. It's a small size uh, record, yeah. It's produced in uh, Singapore. Then you have Andre Go, who is a win, uh, one of the finalists of Bakat TV. Uh, and he is actually Baba uh, from Laka, and he sings uh, Malay songs. So he was also quite a phenomenon because he was uh, somebody that looked, you know, he's Chinese, but he sang Malay and Asli songs really well. Um, I would, of course, direct you to Tan Sui Bing's uh, article on Rongging la, culture to find out more about this style of music. And there's some budding new researchers like Rachel Ong as well that are doing research on Peranakan music in Malaysia. Okay, so DJ Dave, very important as well. So DJ Dave actually started off singing, um, you know, he's of um, South Asian descent, Malaysian or South Asian descent, of Punjabi descent specifically. But he is very popular in the Malay music scene and the Malay industry. Uh, he's still prominent now, today. Uh, he heads uh, an organization. This is DJ Dave in 1974 with Malay songs. This is the iconic artist of Malaysia, uh, which I'm also working, doing research on currently, Sudirman. Okay, this is his first album after winning the Bakat TV competition. Uh, and it's called Teriring Doa. It's first ever recording, uh, first ever studio recording yeah, and release. Uh, and then, of course, you can't talk about popular music without talking about Sharifa Aini. And uh, she has numerous records uh, from the period that I started. But I thought this was interesting because this is kind of a foray into English music. So um, it was quite a rare thing to do, actually, back then, because Malaysian artists had to also compete with popular music from English-speaking countries, right, here. So to do this means probably meant that you're so popular that people will probably just buy your records anyways, even though you're singing in English and you're Malaysian. Discovery is a very important band. In the 1970s, now you have this switch from the, the style of pop, yeah? Or this kind of like more mainstream pop. There's a, we have a transition from a bit of rock, pop, yeah, yeah, you know, rock and roll. Then it gets into more pop, pop that is a mix of both. But in the 70s, you really get to see, or the late 70s, you see the rise of disco, of disco sounds. And bands like Discovery were crucial uh, to that. Um, and it's because of the disco texts, yeah? because of the, the pubs and the clubs. And all these bands would play in these clubs and Malaysian audiences wanted to hear disco, dance music. I mean, of course, nowadays, nowadays, um, you have DJs, right? Spinning dance music and R&B and stuff like that. But back then it was live bands and live bands were needed required to play disco. So these bands who did a lot of covers also did a lot of originals, but they also did Saduran. Saduran is um, like songs that are from famous non-Malaysian songs that are added on with Malay, Malay lyrics. So like Gembira Berdansa is um, play that funky music white man actually. So they have this very interesting, uh, there's some, some very interesting covers here. So you, ch you check this out. They also kind of integrate uh, like kata lompat, kata si kata lompat, you know, like Malay folk songs and things like that into their repertoire as well. So that's very interesting. Carefree, 
very important band. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the song um, Belayan Jiwa, um, that was made more popular by, by uh, Innuendo in the 2000s. These are, this, this is the original band that sang it. And you've, you're starting to see something interesting. You're seeing um, very obvious multiculturalism also in the makeups of the bands. You know, and this is kind of symbolic of, of Malaysia in the 70s as well. Um, but at the same time, there's this, because of the national cultural policy, there's a lot of emphasis on Malay language music. So they were playing music from the West, but you put on Malay, the Malay language on top of it, and you know, you've got the winning combination that appeals to the locals, uh, to, to Malaysians, but also uh, doesn't allow you to be broadcast, you know, on radio and on TV. Carefree Kebebasan 2, I, I mean, I love this album. Uh, this is from my personal collection because of the fashioning as well. You can see this kind of the bright disco style fashion. You've got one here with the Afro, you know, uh, the JJ, very important singer and bassist. Um, of, of course, you've got uh, Justin Leo as well. Um, yeah, you've got more, you've got this, the stylings here. It's, it's just, you, it really takes you back to that era. And Kebebasan 2 is important because this is where Belayan Jiwa is. It was a hit song for them. Alley Cats, uh, very important, uh, not only Malaysian icon, but Penang icon, you know, Penang boys. Um, they also represent this kind of uh, global, kind of, cos I would say, a cosmopolitan uh, aesthetic in Malaysian music that's very strong, you know, because they, they were already playing, you know, out there. Um, oh, mind you, uh, this, this record that I have here, this is uh, officially, we're calling it a reissue, but um, this was actually a unofficial print. The uh, actual uh, official company for this album is actually Philips. Um, but I found um, it's easy to find when you go out and you buy records, uh, records now. Um, you, have to be, you have to know your stuff as in what were the actual original labels. And you find that the prices vary greatly between pirated, sorry, unofficial and uh, official records. Um, but the quality is, you know, the same actually, you know, because they were most likely made by, they were actually made by registered companies back then as well. There was very little control on unofficial productions of music back then in Malaysia. So Derman uh, kind of really starts to rise in the 1980s. He's already an icon, you know, and he has his song called Anak Muda, which I think is also very relevant to the Malay rock discussion because it's, it centers on this discussion about youth and urbanization. You see, he represents a man, a young uh, Malay man uh, living in a small cramped space because presumably he has uh, migrated from somewhere else, most like most probably a rural area. And he's come to the city to, you know, uh, to, to pursue, to pursue his dreams, right? Jamal Abdillah is the de facto bad boy of Malaysian pop. Um, and I mean, he sings, he sings a lot of sentimental songs um, and I guess they're tinges of rock. But even though he's a bad boy, he's still not necessarily the rock icon of Malaysia. Alley Cats kept on going, you know, this is them in 1981, still big. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's all Malay songs here. And you also see some interesting like, you know, inter, um, interweaving of, of Malaysian folk music like Joget, you know, that kind of characterizes musically that music as Malaysian. And now we get to our topic, uh, our feature topic, which is Search. Uh, um, and this is their first album called Cinta Buatan, Buatan Malaysia, uh, Love Made in Malaysia. Uh, and you've got, you've actually got, Search had a lot of band, like member rotations. Um, Yan and Man, this is actually Man Kidal of the band Left Handed. Like he's kind of like Malaysia's, Malaysia's Eddie Van Halen, yeah? Um, and he, he actually like he was oscillating between different bands but in the first album the uh, man and yan from left handed were recording in it yan stayed in search for a while in between that you have sheila majid releasing her kind of brand of pop jazz and you know she was huge not only was she huge in malaysia she was also popular in indonesia and japan as you can see the recording of the song sinaran i mean music students you probably have to perform right the song sinaran uh, i hope you do uh, you should because it's kind of like endemic to Malaysian popular music. So this was actually a new recording of the song made in Japan. This is actually a, a album reissue that was released in uh, 2019. Now we're going to listen to a little bit of music, a little bit of music. This is a song that I feel is very important. Uh, it's a song uh, from Searcher's third album, Mentari Merah di Ufok Timur, uh, Red Sunset, 
from the east on the horizon. And this is a song, Pelesit Kota, which, yeah, I'll play. So I can't play too much of the clip, but enough for you to get a sense of this kind of like, there were these neoclassical influences in rock, right? And heavy metal. But then you have the distinctive um, uh, guitar, distorted guitar sounds, uh, solid guitar sounds, um, the, the drums, the loud snare backbeat emphasize. Um, it's loud, you know, it's, it's also, but it's also very controlled and, and well-planned. You've got Hilary Ang on the lead guitar there as well. I you know highly recommend after this please go and listen to some search and you know really have a listen to Placid Kota as well. This is an iconic song from them among many others. A lot of people um, are more familiar with the song that I'll be talking about later, Isabella, but I wanted to talk more about their heavier repertoire to give you guys an idea of where they came from. So that's search. And now we're in 1987, 1989. We have Fran or Francesca Peter. And you have these albums back then where you start to see here towards the, the, the 90s or the mid 80s and onwards, actually cassettes were the important medium um, of, of uh, music. Um, and this album was probably released mainly on cassette for Fran, but this was a special copy, a vinyl copy that was made uh, maybe for radio DJs or promotional purposes. You see it's uh, not for sale, right? And what they would do is that they would tampal, they would stick the actual cassette sleeve on this, on this record. There wasn't a, a custom-made record cover. So Dirman wins Asia's number one performer in 1989. Without a doubt, um, there are many strong rock influences in his music as well. You can see some glam influences here as well in the way that he's dressing and the flamboyance, right, of how he's showing, of how he's fashioning himself. It's also probably related to other styles of glam, uh, such as David Bowie uh, and so forth, and, and you know, other bands as well. Suderman, if you want to check out one of, he has, he has a, a few songs here, it's quite a wide variety, but he has one song that has more of a rock feel as well. And of course, the most important song for you to know is 1,000 Million Smiles. That's a song that won him the competition in Royal Albert Hall in England in 1989. Ella, the queen of rock, is iconic uh, for Malay rock, uh, and iconic for Malay popular music in general. This is one of her first albums, Pengemis Cinta, Beggar for Love. And then we end, uh, we'll, well, we're heading towards the end of our visual history here, Search Phenomena, which was a phenomenon in sales. I do have to correct some of the figures uh, of sales that I put up uh, in the abstract. Hopefully it attracted more of you guys to come. But I will, I will share with you the actual sales figures uh, that they achieved in Malaysia and Indonesia in a bit. Zainal Abidin is also iconic of uh, Malay popular music in the 1990s. Here is a slight departure away from rock. You know, like, like Sheila was, was popularizing uh, pop jazz. Zainal Abidin was popularizing world beat, you know, this kind of world music that was popularized by Paul Simon in the States. Um, the, the album Graceland is an important world music album. Uh, and But here, Zainal leverage on being in Malaysia. Look, I mean, in Malaysia, you have the multicultural melting pot of different cultures and musical influences and people, you know, with different uh, musical backgrounds. So he's got this alat gendang traditional here, you know, all the percussion, Malay per percussions. He's got 
Modern Keyboards by Jenny Chin and Mac Chu. Very important if you guys uh, want to get into the playing scene. Uh, he's got Erwin Gutao, who's actually Indonesian. So he's got some cross Nusantara collaboration going on here. You've got Tabla. You've got Ti Anggapan on, on Tabla. So he's in, integrating South, um, South Asian uh, influences as well. Drums and percussion by Zahid Af Ahmad, guitar obligatory. And guess what? You've got Man Kidal from Left Handed, formerly also of Search, playing electric guitar. So Man Kidal was also used as a soloist across many uh, genres of Malay popular music in this era, yeah? 80s and 90s. Let's take a little side note. I'm going to have a little drink uh, because uh, cheers, it's uh, some mint tea actually. Notice I have a cassette on the, on the mug, right? Not planned at all. Side note, Nusantara. What is Nusantara? So Nusantara actually comes from this word, Nusa Antara, yeah? in the Malay Indonesian language, which actually means in between islands. So if we look at the geographical kind of location of the Nusantara, it actually includes uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, a lot of Indonesia, Indonesia is huge, actually. Indonesia is a main feature of Nusantara. And also a little bit, and also the Philippines. In, in the book that I, that I co-edited with Michael A. Santayala, we used the term made in Nusantara to, to kind of capture the music of this mainly Malay-speaking world. Of course, not just Malay is spoken. There are many different communities and groups. Um, but, but this is essentially, these are the, the countries or regions that fall into the Nusant Nusantara imagination. Why do I use the term Nusantara? Um, I like to think about it um, as a shared space and history, um, one of colonial, post-colonial and decolonial history. Um, there was a lot um, of shared history in terms of the, 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 the Western empires that occupied the space. And I want to look away from the Southeast Asia and ASEAN. And Southeast Asia is an area studies kind of equation that was formulated by the West. ASEAN, yeah, is a, is a very interesting pro, um, uh, cross transnational project, but it includes a lot of mainland Southeast Asia uh, that don't speak the Malay language. So we are trying to focus in on the Malay. Of course, people use the word Malay world as well, um, but I guess I wanted to use, we want to use Nusantara because it's actually a local term, you know, as well. So we want to also decenter the discourse towards more local, locally grounded terms, yeah. Um, so Nusantara also represents these kind of fluid interactions that we see through the sea um, that are characteristic of all the relationships in this, uh, in this region. That's why everyone has so many shared uh, cultural qualities, yeah, and affinities. Balada Nusantara was a, a genre of popular music that was popularized in the 90s, kind of coming out from the rock kapa era, the, sorry, the Malay rock era. Uh, and Irama Malaysia was also something that came out of this Nusantara vibe. Interestingly, it was Malaysian artists like M. Nasir and Pak Nga that were popularizing this style of music, Balada Nusantara, in the 1990s. Um, it also drew from World Beat, um, so they, they were trying to draw from like how Zaina Abidin's album was, draw from different elements from both local, regional, as well as global elements into um, the music. And they also, um, and you know, Santayla, Michael uh, Santayla, my, my co-editor for Made in Santara has a chapter which talks about the different ways that global popular music uh, interacts and is mixed or adapted with local music, yeah? So he sees this kind of music. If you look at his theory or his system, you could see Balada Nusantara and Irama Malaysia as a national genre based on global popular music. So let's get into search. Okay, we're going to look specifically at, I mean, I don't have enough time to talk specifically about the whole history of the band and that. I mean, I highly recommend as a, if you're a student of, of music, you know, go online and find out. Um, I'm also going to share with you that I'm working on some on some writing as well, where everything is kind of laid out for you. But that that'll be a while. Um, but Search was uh, mainly they were they were Malaysian band. Uh, the two the the bassist and the uh, the bassist and the original guitarist Hilary Ang came from Johor Bahru. They played a gig uh, in KL. Actually, there's a lot of details that I, I really don't have time to get into. But what you want what I want you to focus on is. There were a, a band of musicians that got together playing in the pub scene, the live scene 
of the 1980s. This is like we're talking 1981. So they start playing in this club, this club called the Red Rooster. Um, the lineup changes. The original singer and guitarist Zaina Rampa decides to form another band, go somewhere else. So Yazid, drummer, and Hilary Ang need to find new musicians. So they they go back to Johor Bahru and find this postman, this young man working as a post dispatch clerk named uh, Suhaimi. Uh, Suhaimi, oh Suhaimi, Suhaimi, right? So Suhaimi is Amy. So now Amy, you know, Amy was 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 just about to get. Um, he was already singing in weddings and stuff like that. They called him over and hey, let's go to KL. So they brought him to KL. They brought, they found uh, Nase, the bass player, and they started forming uh, the band Search. And Search actually started off as a cover band, playing a lot of surprise, surprise, heavy metal music from bands such as Scorpions. Amy was known for that for singing Scorpion songs. And also bands like Led Zeppelin and other you know popular rock bands from the West. Fast forward about five years later, they get a record deal. This is five years after playing the Red Rooster, and then they get a contract at Hard Rock Cafe, which at the time was in Taman Tun in KL. They get a contract with Polygram to record Mentari Merah di Ufuk Timur, that album with Pelisik Kota, and that's when they start composing original music and they start building their popular popularity. And you know, at the same time, they're also playing live music. Fast forward then, a few more albums, right? This is album, uh, this is album number, yes, this is album number four, right? They release Phenomena. And it is a phenomenon, not only in Malaysia, but also in Indonesia. Not only was, uh, did they have albums, it was such a phenomenon, it was such a popular album. There, was a, there were films made about it based on their most famous song called Isabella. You know, and there were the, the, the Malaysian film called Phenomena, directed by Aziz M. Osman, has a main title character. Um, the character is played, played by Ramona Rahman. Her name is Isabella. You know, and it plays around with that. And of course, the soundtrack of Search is used generously. M. Nase, who is the kind of man that writes all almost all the songs for Search back then, is a star there. Um, is the main character. And Amy is also plays a role as well. However, I don't want to talk so much about what how Search was doing in Malaysia. That's kind of like, they did really well in Malaysia, obviously, being a Malaysian band, playing the live music rock scene. I'll talk a little bit about what doesn't get talked about much, which is how popular Search as a Malaysian band was in Indonesia, Okay, which leads me to this kind of Nusantara collaborations. So not only were they sending the music abroad to Indonesia, they were also collaborating with people in Indonesia as well. Isabella is a film directed by Azmi Muhammad and Boyki Roaring in 1990. And here they're more explicit about it. They just call the film Isabella because that is their most famous song, right? And it is about a boy who meets a girl, okay? The boy is Malaysian and he's a rocker and he happens to be Amy and he has a band called Search. So that's the actual film. Isabella is a girl who's studying from Indonesia but her dad, who's an uh, important uh, diplomat or government official, is stationed in Kuala Lumpur. She meets Amy, they fall in love, but the dad finds out and he does not like rockers at all. You know, because he's very much like Najib Razak, right? Who back then really looked down on this young uh, Malay youth, Malay rocker youth. And that story is all about um, them. You know, she then has to leave Indonesia. She, the, the father forbids her from going to any of his shows, which, you know, really sucks. And then she goes back to Indonesia and Search is really big. It's, a, it's also a movie about the band Search. They go to Indonesia and he performs there and she finds him. She stands up to her parents and says, no, I want to be with Amy. I don't care what you say. He's a rocker, but he's a good person. And they find she finds him and he sings for her, Isabella, in the concert, in the scene of the film. So this is the song Isabella, okay? Um, Isabella is the love story of two worlds. Why did we meet only to be separated? The day is lost, engulfed by the darkness of night. Worlds torn apart ends this tale. She is Isabella, symbol of doom love, separated because of different cultural beliefs. Love fades with withering leaves. Yeah, I just I read the, the English part, but you can read the Malay part. Uh, and if you if you're Malaysian, you probably already know this song, or you've probably heard it multiple times already, right? Okay. So let's talk a bit about Isabella. I want to talk about not only the, I want to talk about it as uh, musically, yeah? Isabella is um, what you could call a power ballad. Uh, and this uh, researcher who wrote in the Journal of Popular Music uh, has a very interesting like uh, system to analyze power ballads. 
So power ballads uh, represented this kind of sentimentality. And these power ballads were a genre uh, that was, was a style of song, yeah? a style of song uh, that, trend, that crossed different genres. One very important power ballad is the song, I Will Always Love You, by, sung by Whitney Houston. You know, and a lot of the Disney songs that you hear at the end of the movie, you know, like um, Beauty and the Beast and, uh, you know, that her, like, I Will Go the Distance and all these kind of songs that you hear after the film sung by pop artists, they, fought, they use that formula of the power ballad. However, heavy metal bands like Bon Jovi, Scorpions, um, they also thrived on, on, aside from their heavy music, also played ballads that were actually their biggest pop songs. And it, the power in these ballads comes from the, sentimental, the sentimentality in the lyrics and in the music that actually allowed men, you know, these new male artists to express a kind of sensitivity and vulnerability that was not normally um, accepted in more conservative, you know, in their more conservative traditions, and especially in like, um, even in America and in Europe. You know, now you have men that are talking about their feelings in songs, but in a very emotional and vulnerable, vulnerable way, not in the necessarily old school macho way that you, you get in songs like by Elvis, for example. Um, you also have a courting of intimacy through themes of love and loss. Sound familiar, right? Isabella is about a separated love, people separated uh, from different cultural beliefs. And this intimacy actually allows the crossing of genre lines. Um, so for example, um, you have bands that normally play heavy songs. When they play, play a power ballad, their, their sound becomes different. So the distortion on the guitar gets either turned down or clarified, you know, and they play slower tempos in uh, such as Fantasia Bulan Madu, another important song. They get rid of the drums altogether. Yazid gets a break from playing the drums. In Isabella, it starts off very slow and sentimental. There's a lot of synthesizers, you know, and it's different from a song like Polisic Kota, for example, which has that driving kind of rock vibe. So it uses this formula of sentimentality and uplift. So it is a very sentimental kind of emotional narrative, but musically the song goes up and up and up and up and it climaxes. And then sometimes it'll drop again and go up a bit more. Okay. In terms of musical arrangement, you have the dynamics, right? Of a so soft to loud dynamic build. And also in terms of instrumentation, you can have little, a few instruments. For example, Isabella, it starts with a bass uh, of the chorus effect solo, just bass. And then suddenly, um, then suddenly you get the, the synthesizers come in with the line and then Amy starts to sing over the synthesizer and the bass. And then only in the second half of the first verse, you hear pak or pak, and then you hear the snare and, and the drum beat comes in. So that is, you have a slowly building uh, instrumental arrangement from sparse to more dense. Okay, and of course, the, the, uh, if, if we uh, quickly, just a very quick analysis of Isabella musically, you got that bass solo, the vocals over the synth, the pop, snare drum, you know, and then you've got a uh, kid's solo, which is really, for me, is the climax, especially at the end of the solo, he uses all this, like, though any, those of you who are guitarists will know that, you know, kid is also very much influenced by Eddie Van Halen and probably Ingwe Malmsteen, and, you know, he's got the, He's got the tapping going on, or the, the big leaps, uh, big, oct oct big octave leaps. He's got hammer-ons and pull-offs. He's using the whammy bar or the vibrato bar, official term, to get those like dive bomb sounds, you know, kind of sounds. Um, and he's and he, he brings the solo to a climax. And at that last note, at the minor third of the of the note that he hits, Amy comes in and sings Dia Isabella, you know, in harmony to that. So you've got this climax and then they, they fade down to a verse and then they bring it up again. So yeah, power ballad. So that's my kind of analysis of Isabella as a power ballad. Um, I can't play you the whole song, but um, maybe what I'll do is I'll try to fast forward. This is the scene where, you know, I'll just play you, show you some visual clips. This is Isabella in the film, Amy is singing. He's in Jakarta. They're playing a show in Jakarta. Look at the crowd. They love search there. <laughs> okay. And it's indoor gig. And then Isabella is there, but then, oh my God, she's there. She loves the song and Amy sees her and he walks up to her. Hey. 
song because of copyright issues. And you can see them going into a montage. from the guitar solo and then you got Amy coming in right so phenomena here are the real figures um, official figures that I got from uh, newspaper clippings was 200,000 in Malaysia and 600,000 in Indonesia uh, and the film was actually shot um, the film was actually searches first concert they, it coincided with their first concert in, in, in Indonesia and they perform in this area called Senayan which is actually Jakarta lah um, and, and then the story, I already kind of gave you a background to the story, yeah? but the most important part is that this, her father disapproves, right? And it kind of represents the, the, this views that the older generation back then had about rock culture and youth and the deviancy of Malay rock culture, okay? Let's talk about some collaborations. So I'm not going to play this song. I want you to check it out. This is this is actually a song called Cinta Kita by Amy and the Indonesian pop artist Inka Christi. I'm going to play a bit for you. Lah. In the lyrics of this song, which is actually taken from Fantasia Bulan Madu, their third album, Mentari Mera, you've got this, you've got this poetics of the sea, you know, of the ocean. Andai di pisah laut dan pantai. If we were separated by the sea and the shores, you know, which really plays into this idea of the of Nusantara relationships as well. And this song was very interesting because what, what it was was it was a repackage, repackage of um, Searcher's old song, very popular song called Fantasia Bulan Mandu that was already popular in Indonesia. And they got uh, the young up and coming potential rock queen of Indonesia, Inka Christi. She was an up and coming artist to sing this as a duet with Amy, Amy Search. So what they did was in 91, they released Charisma, which is one of my favorite albums actually from Search. Um, and they sold a few hundred thousand, but then they, the record executives from their company, BMG, was like, mm, maybe we can try something else. Let's do an Indonesian version of Charisma. We do the recording with Inka Christie. We repackage the song Fantasia Bulan Madu to Cinta Kita. And then we add that as a first song to Charisma. <laughs> so they repackage the album. Yeah, it's a bit confusing, but they repackage Charisma album as Cinta Kita. And that album, because of this song, sold 300,000 units in Indonesia, which is already, I mean, not as good as Phenomena, but already good, lah. Uh, especially for a Malaysian band. And you have to understand that back then in Malaysia, in Indonesia, they have a very protectionist economic policy on their cultural products. Um, for example, if you want to release, if you want to, if you want to broadcast yourself on radio, you have to have elements of that song or your production that have Indonesians in it, yeah? So the collaboration was very important. So this is how Search and the record executives found a way to tap a bit more into the Indonesian market. Search actually won an award in Indonesia called the HDX Award. Uh, and they had to create a new category called the foreign band category, which means that Search actually sold more than some top Indonesian pop artists as well. Okay. So this is a very interesting moment in history, I think. Um, I've not done uh, enough research on Sheila Majid, but I, I think you'll find similar stories there as well. And I'm uh, hoping that, that anyone who's interested, you know, do it. Uh, and also, my, I know that my colleague and I are interested in pursuing that as well. But this is a, in, something that doesn't get researched much is Malaysian popular music in this time period, the 80s and 90s, doing really well in Indonesia, you know, because it's really an uphill battle. But 
it's quite a phenomenon if you can crack the market. And Indonesian fans are really appreciative, you know, of the music. If you, um, you could go to most Indonesians today and they will know who Amy Search is and they might even be able to sing back a few, at least they will sing back Cinta Kita or Isabella to you. And a lot of Indonesians probably know Search's music better than most Malaysians, you know. So this is an interesting phenomenon that I love to look into. This is uh, the most artistic and provocative album cover. This is uh, from the album uh, that they released in 1992 called Rampage. Okay. And it was not without controversy. However, I won't talk so much about the controversies that were occurring at home. Um, but Rampage was very important in terms of our Nusantara connections because as the sixth album for, for their release, they did a 12, to launch the album, they decided to start in Indonesia. At least the original plan was to do so. But they managed to, to collaborate with an uh, event, uh, event company over there um, and uh, the record label uh, as well. And they did a 12-stop tour in Sumatra in these towns. Banda Aceh, Sigli, Biruen, Lok Sumawe, Aceh Timur, Takenggon, Langsa, Binjai. I mean, do my, I mean, I mean, for Malaysian bands to even do that nowadays, I mean, I, I can't imagine how difficult that would be, right? But they were searched. And, you know, they were, they were really like reports of them from Malaysian newspapers. Those, those are my sources. Um, say that their concerts in each of these stops would have about minimum 5,000 to 10,000 people. And then you have 10,000 people in like paying for tickets, but there'll be 5,000 people more outside of the concert grounds wanting to listen to them. You know, and their reception was also big. Um, and you can see from these news reports, this is where I got some of that data, yeah? um, that they were well received in Indonesia and still quite, still very relevant. And yeah, they get attacked in, you know, search gets swarmed by fans, you know, they're warmly received and they're just, a, they're still a popular culture icon in Indonesia. So Let's uh, fast forward a little bit to present times. Um, yeah, search is, uh, I think I've reached my time limit, right? Or almost at my time limit. Um, I'm, almost, I'm actually gonna wrap up, yeah, Dr. Pravina. Um, so Samaran Amy did Jakarta. So in present time, 929, Amy is still a popular icon. And you know, there was a report where he was, he, where he did a publicity stunt for the MRT launch in Jakarta. You know, he's, people still know him to the point that he has to disguise himself on the streets of Jakarta to not be seen. A little bit of a video. This is a reunion video of Search and Inca Christie. I'm not going to play the song, but you can see uh, in this program called Golden Memories Asia, which is a very Nusantara kind of program. It's a, it's, um, a singing competition in Indonesia on Indosiar, and they invite singers from Malay-speaking countries, uh, Brunei, Singapore, Malaysia, to compete and sing. And in this year, 2019, Amy was one of the judges, there he is. He was one of the commentators or, or judges, yeah? And they have all these performances and they got him and they reunited him with Inca Christie. You know, so you can see that there's still kind of, some kind of relevance there. Okay. So I'm gonna wrap up with uh, some, some broad conclusions. Hopefully that they will tie in uh, with what I've shown. So we saw from early on, like in terms of the music, Searcher's music actually represented this mix of global metal. It was unique also to Malaysia, yeah? you global heavy metal styles, but it also related to audiences um, with a mix of both heavy music, yeah? the like Palisade Kota, right? And, also, and sentimental power ballads. I think it was that combination is, is what made them. Not just, and I'm, when I talk about search, I'm also, I'm talking about search as a representation of the Malay rock genre as well. There's so many bands back then that I haven't been able to touch on. And I think um, um, people like Dr. Taki, Taki Yudin uh, will be pioneering uh, that effort to, to do the rich ethnography of Malay, Malay rock. But for now, from my focus on search, you know, this is, this is what we got, that genre, that unique genre mix that ended up becoming very, a very Malaysian Nusantara thing. But in terms of listening to Malay rock, um, we can also hear, like, especially in songs like Isabella, this kind of intimacy, this intimacies and connections between Nusantara youth. Uh, think about the story of, of Amy and Isabella in the film. 
And these youth, even though they're in different countries, they're all uh, experiencing the same kind of urbanization and globalization uh, issues uh, individually. And also facing, of course, issues such as they are drawn to certain uh, cultures like rock culture, but their parents who are from a different era uh, and also are more maybe more grounded in traditional and Islamic culture, for example, are very anxious about these new forms of expressions. But I also want to draw attention to this kind of mobility, yeah, the movement aspect of, of search and how they were able to, to move across Indonesia and Malaysia uh, through concert tours and artistic collaboration. So for me, this kind of represents a porous crossing, like this kind of fluidity across these borders. And of course, movement is, and mobility is a very important feature of being a rock artist. Um, the concept of the tour has been uh, researched as well. Uh, by, uh, by an article by Novoa, which I shared at the, at the end. Um, and I, I, I'm interested to explore this idea of mobility and music and rock and expression further, but I'm bringing this towards the context of the history of the Nusantara as well. The boundary crossings of search, however, they, they represent this power that is manifested in rock and Malay rock. And Malay rock actually has uh, in, in, inherent power and there's been a lot of research that talks about power in rock. And I haven't even begun to talk about the gendered dimensions um, of rock as well. And this is just a kind of a surface overview. So aside from boundary crossings, which I, which I highlighted earlier, we also want to, I also concept, I also want to think about not just uh, boundary crossings, but movements, you know, in, in the way that we use it in the term social movements. Now, this one, like um, the Malay rock, uh, movement was not an official, political, or formal one, but it did, did very much represent mostly male working class youth, and they were challenging the hegemonic norms. They were challenging the norms of a conservative ethno-national state. Um, and when I say back then, the, the ruling uh, government was AMNO, and the iconic figure of Malaysia was Mahade Muhammad. Yeah? And Mahade Muhammad was, had this vision of well, he had this, this, this thing called Vision 2020, all right, in which he wanted to bring Malaysia into the level of a developed nation. However, if you think about his idea of Vision 2020 and this Asian values formulation, you should be hardworking. You know, think about uh, Japan and progress, right? The more, as a model, hardworking, diligent, you know, um, educated, refined, cultured. But the Malay rock youth were the opposite of that, at least the opposite of what they wanted. Okay, and that's why I, I feel that Malay rock in itself is also a, an informal movement of sorts. So just to uh, end, um, what can we do now? I mean, there's a lot more to research. There's a lot more yet to be researched. Um, we didn't really get to talk about the tensions between Malay rock and Islam. And I put a question mark there because there's a common, there's a common uh, perception that Malay rock and Islam are like butting heads. Um, but um, actually, it was, it's not that straightforward, okay? And also, in 1992, just around the same time as the Rampage Tour, there was this very sensationalized media event and, and national uh, event of the long hair ban, which involved, um, at the time, the information minister who controlled RTM and all the media outlets was Muhammad Rahmat, very iconic, actually, iconic figure in Malaysian politics. Um, so, in 1992, they imposed a ban on Malay rock bands uh, that had on where the singers had long hair that fell below the shoulder. And this ban restricted their music from being played on radio and on TV. And, you know, it played out in a very interesting way. In fact, I do have research on that, but I'm not going to present that today. So do stay tuned for some future presentations as well. Okay. So rock kapat today, however, I mean, that we, it hasn't been uh, really studied uh, much, but these are some of the issues that prop up. Um, one is this idea of retro, like the retrospective uh, appreciation of rock kapat. There's documentaries called rock kapat. I talk about the problem, right, of using the term rock kapat, but rock kapat is not, is, is this retro term, yeah? Um, and it should be problematized. It's also a way of branding the music from then. Um, but, where, but sometimes that branding can also be negative, you know. Um, so we also want to try and find a way to give agency to the rock artists and the rock fans from that era. 
which is why I, 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 I along with, with uh, Dr. Taki, I agree that we should use the term rock, lah, rock. But for the international audience, we will say Malay rock, lah, Malay rock. Okay. Another issue that's very important is aging and hijrah. Because Malay rockers back then are not as young as they were before. Okay. So issues of aging, a lot of this has been studied in uh, popular music studies. Uh, I think also relates to the, um, um, increased uh, piety, Islamic piety. And it just so happens that we do have some interesting research on that. Um, and I'll share some in a bit. So with regards to retro, so Amy Search um, has his own company called amysearch.com, Aku Amy, yeah, uh, <laughs> Aku amysearch.com. And he sells a, a, a three-in-one coffee uh, and he has all these interesting products. And, you know, I, I definitely bought into it. I definitely wanted this set. Uh, he has pineapple flavored coffee and teh tarik. Pineapple coffee is, is a kind of local uh, delicacy in JB, in Johor Bahru, in, in Johor. So he's a Johor boy, so... He's also rapping there. And in his website, uh, akuemisearch.com, he also sells jubas. So this is relates to this kind of retro rebranding of, of, of Malay rock culture, but also this hijrah yeah, towards a more Islamic. Of course, I mean, uh, more, you could also read this as a commodification of, of Islam as well, or using Islam to, you know, uh, find, you know, find new ways to make business, entrepreneurial Islam. Uh, but you can see a completely refiguring of that persona, right? And now you don't have long hair search. You don't have long hair Amy anymore. You have Amy with his, you know, trademark uh, kopiak. It's actually the same kind of hat that uh, Nehru actually used to wear in India. Interesting, yeah? And then you have this controversy now of the site uh, Phenomena Search, um, which was a site that was formed by this Malay entrepreneur who sells licensed uh, search products. But the ex-members of Search, Amy is actually an ex-member. He left Search uh, sometime in, uh, in 2020, 20, 20, he left, officially left Search. Uh, and the, the, the former bassist, Nasi, they're suing this company um, because apparently they didn't secure copyrights to the name Phenomena and Search. So there's some interesting issues to, in, to look into. In terms of existing research on Hijrah and Malay rockers, check out uh, Dominic Mueller. Uh, and he has a really good article on Islamic politics where, uh, where a lot of rockers are actually um, recruited into the party PAS, yeah? the Islamic party, Party Se Islam Malaysia, uh, that has a strong base, uh, not you know, all over, a lot in, in North and East Malaysia. Uh, and they actually, they engage with rock artists who actually speak and perform for them. You know? And they also have like youth outreach programs that involve jam like past sponsored jam studios, you know, and whatnot. And these are actually led by the past youth members, of course. So rock is still relevant to Islam, not necessarily against it. Maybe it's instrumentalized by Islam, Islamic uh, polit politicians now, right? Um, I'm very proud of this uh, chapter that is in uh, our edited book, Made in Nusantara. I think it's a very important contribution to the study. Um, uh, Raja Iskandar talks about doesn't talk about rock. He talks about Nashid music. I haven't even been able to touch on that. Um, and Nashid music for bands like Raihan, for example, that were huge. I think they were even bigger phenomenon, right, than Malay rock. Uh, that's something that definitely needs further research. Uh, in fact, there is some existing research already. Um, actually, there's a considerable amount of research on Nashid already, uh, not to discount the good work that's been done. But Raja is kind of talks about he highlights how a lot of Nashid um, producers and musicians also came from this Malay rock culture, you know, but they have now, a lot of them who are based in Kelantan, have berhijrah. They have done the spiritual pilgrimage. Yeah, sorry, I didn't define that. Hijrah means spiritual pilgrimage uh, towards more Islamic piety in their life. But what he highlights is that this kind of pilgrimage doesn't really clash with their their commitment to music or their profession and their art as music. They just adapt the music in different ways. And a lot of them adapted towards Nashid. Okay. So yeah, that's, uh, I'm done. I've got some photo credits here if this is distributed. And I've got a list of recommended readings for your future classes. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I guess we, uh, I guess we can go into questions now. Thank you, Adil. Thank you so much. I think Sarina and I on the site were texting each other. Oh my God, we know that song. Oh my God, we recognize that album. There you go. So yeah, we kind of grew up with this and I, I thought it was very important for 
music students of this generation to be introduced to this because if you are Malay students, somehow or other, you might have been introduced to it through parents, uncles, aunties growing up. But I think the other races, the Malays and the Chinese, were not do not have that much of exposure. And it's very important as music students to have a well-rounded, well-balanced uh, knowledge or opinion or even exposure to what Malay, uh, Malaysian music and the kind of music that actually influenced music of today. So we have a few questions. I was actually, when you were talking about that incident of cutting hair, I think I uh, I included that in my PhD, if I'm not mistaken, where I might be wrong, but there was a scene or there was a time when one of the rockers actually had his hair cut on stage or on yeah. live television. Yeah. Because to show, as a mark of, you know, informing the rest of them, I don't know which rocker was this, but it just brought back memories. It was, uh, it was Amy from Search and it was Awi oh. from Wings. So they Awi were, from yes. Wings, yes. Yeah, Awi and Amy, yeah. Who actually had their hair cut on... They had on it Mata cut by Muhammad Rahmat himself. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I it's spoke about this. Moment. Yeah, correct, correct. It was quite iconic for all musicians of that genre and they were all up in roars with how the musicians were being treated and how music was perceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I will go to the questions. I think there's one that um, I'll start with. We have questions that I gave you prior from our music students, right. but there's one from Shamil who says, um, thank you, Dr. Adil, fascinating stuff. Could you comment on some reasons why rock and or metal was or is so popular with especially the Malay community even till today? Other places, um, he says in brackets like the West, it seems more popular in subcultures, but here in Nusantara, it seems to be the mainstream. Why do you think so? Okay, so um, if we're going to talk about um, ethnicity, like Malay ethnicity and the inclination towards rock, and if we are going to compare it to other uh, parts of the world, we have to remember that in the United States, rock and heavy metal is a very white Caucasian male thing as well. So actually there's some interesting resonances between uh, majority cult majority ethnicity cultures, like for example in Malaysia, the majority Malay, um, and you know in the states as well, right? Majority white. But then what we need to think about is actually um, also class, not just ethnicity, because this the Malay rock actually appealed. You can talk to a lot of um, Malay uh, people from that era. If they were more like like me, Pelat, were more like English speakers, mid upper middle class, you they would probably say, oh no, no, I don't, I don't listen to, to Malay rock. I, I listen to English rock or British music or American music, you know. So you've got also this, this looking down on this music as well. So to answer the question of why <laughs> this it your question raises more questions, lah, actually. You know, so um, it's is there a direct answer? My answer would be, based on what we know, it is this kind of, this mass migration of Malays from rural areas to the cities in the 80s and 90s. This uh, increasing urbanization, there's a lot of theories also about heavy metal and rock, which is related to industrialization. So as we have increasingly urbanized and industrialized societies, uh, I don't know if it's like a sonic social thing, where people want to hear like music of that is aesthetic, to the environments that they're in. And also, it's, um, I think, yeah, you have this kind of fashioning of all youth are finding ways to fashion their identities. So I think this heavy metal identity was something that obviously appealed to them en masse. And, you know, when, when you know, it's like some, when something trends, right, online, you know, it becomes a trend, it becomes big and then it, it trends. So why specifically Malays? Mm, that's a tough. That's a tough one. Of course, socialization plays uh, plays a role um, because it just so happens. I think that you know the circles of a lot of these Malay youth were also other Malays. You know, but there were there were exceptions. I want to draw. Actually, it's a, it's a good question, Doctor Pravina. If you don't mind, um, it raises some very interesting um, things that people do not see about Malaysian the Malaysian popular music industry. Actually, there were a lot of also non Malays that were very important to the production and distribution of the music as well. A lot of the sound engineers were not Malays, you know. In fact, a lot of the early albums of Search were recorded in Lion Studio in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and you know, that you even have lyricists uh, of, of Indian backgrounds writing as well. 
Um, and yeah, Alley Cats was actually, even though Alley Cats did, they were most Indian and Chinese band, even though they, they did like pop evergreen songs, actually they, a lot of them saw themselves as rock musicians as well. They listened to a lot of rock music, which is what the record company wanted them to play. Um, so yeah, in terms of the simple answer was, um, this music was in the language of Malay, but it had that global music style. So I think that's what that's what um, appealed. appealed to the Malay community, and then it grew yeah. to become a Malay thing. Yeah. Right, became a phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, Malay phenomenon. Um, another question I have here: Why rock me? Why is rock music no longer as popular among the society today? That's a tough one to answer because I would say it's still popular. <laughs> I like rock. I think rock has, I think, um, I think rock has, maybe it's because of the person that's asking the question, maybe does either is a hardcore rock fan that is seeing all their friends not listening to rock or you are somebody that somebody who doesn't know rock. Don't know rock. And yeah. rock is actually in a lot of our music. In fact, a lot of Malay, even Malay pop, now, if you listen to a lot of Malay pop songs, uh, especially the ballads, there will be a guitar solo in there. And that yeah. guitar solo will have these rock elements. Yeah. So rock is actually everywhere, just like other kinds of musics are found everywhere. So I would say, listen harder, and then maybe you'll hear the rock. You'll hear it. It's yeah. evolved, but it's there. Of course, yeah. It's just that it's taken different forms and, and, and manifested in different ways, but it is definitely there, yeah. I, I, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, I've got a few questions from music students. Uh, what got you interested in this area of research? Like, what was so relevant between the periods of eighties and nineties? Mm, that's a really great. Um, thank you so much for the kind question. It's always nice to be asked about your personal interests, right? I love asking this question to researchers as well. Um, I am a grunge kid. I grew up in Penang in the nineties. I grew up listening to underground rock music, but I'm also a sex, a jazz saxophonist. <laughs> so I was kind of like this conflicted kid uh, in the teenager in the 90s. So as you see, I shared that I, you know, I like Sepultra, I'm a fan of Sepultra, Nirvana, Rage Against the Machine. I was one of those snuck up, uh, stuck up middle class Malay kids that didn't really listen to Malay rock as much. You see, uh, but as I progress in my music research career, after being a, a, a professional musician, I became an educator. Um, I, I actually, um, my early, my PhD research is actually on Malay film music from the 50s and 60s. And from that, I was exposed to the phenomenon of pop yay yay or Malay rock and roll, which I started off right with the history there of uh, Ahmad Dawood. Uh, and from then I realized that, you know, guitar music is, is intrinsic to the history of popular culture in the Malay world. Um, and, and I'm interested to know, I'm like the like the question that was asked, I'm also interested to know why. Why is it, why is it so important? Um, so that's what uh, led to me. The 80s and 90s as a period is very important socially and politically for me to study because it was the kind of apex of Malaysia's economic growth. Um, we had Mahade Muhammad helming the ship. Uh, with his very uh, successful economic policies, but also with his iron fist politically and socially on society, um, which is why you see the tensions uh, of youth culture being needing to be controlled because you're trying to project your vision of what is a perfect Malaysia, mm -hmm. but then you have this youth who are doing something that's very different. The complete opposite. You know, the complete opposite. You know, so I think it's great. I think it's great. Uh, it's a great period to study because obviously people don't remember um, in the public discourse the 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 deviants as much as they remember the Mahades yes. and politicians. So yeah. this research is very important because we want to give voice to the, those who did not. They were singing very loudly, but they don't have much of a voice in the political history. So it's actually yeah. political as well. It's a very important uh, political study. Music is political as well. It was viewed as a voice of protest, isn't it? Rock music, hip hop music. It can. I mean, it's this is the tricky one. It, I mean, like it can be. I I think it's viewed as a voice of protest by the establishment. Yes. Because yes. it's, but it's not necessarily by those who practice it. Practice it. I think yes. there's a range. I mean, of course, you have bands like Public Enemy is very 
very explicit, but then NWA was like the hip hop group was more like you know was more yeah. like to, to, to outrightly to calling out up. the police, right? You know, f the police and stuff like that. And then you have um, but the same with rock, uh, rock. There were a lot of rock, a lot of Malay rock was not political in content because of censorship in Malaysia. As well. Correct. So it's a Correct. combination. That's so right. you have a combination of that. But it's interesting. This is where cultural politics is very interesting because without saying politics, politics is still have is still being enacted, performed. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And the very fact that you go against the establishment, it's already a form of anti-establishment when they say no long has and you it may not necessarily be an act of anti-establishment. It may just be a projection of identity, mm -hmm. but it seems as a voice of anti-establishment because this has been said, don't do. And then they, they come across as being seen as projecting that long hair, regardless of the rulings that, but I, I agree. The musicians see it as a projection of an extension of themselves, mm -hmm. not so much as a voice of protest. And but, I mean, in a weird kind of way, the the imposition of the establishment actually gives rise to more <laughs> to voice. Defiant. and yeah. maybe hopefully more social consciousness as well i have a very loose i mean this is not a well qualified theory but i have a very loose theory mm -hmm. that malay rock culture is kind of like this precursor to reform rc culture it's, it's a cultural precursor of course, I mean, we have to dig deeper, right? Into yeah, to that. see. But I think a lot of people that were involved in Reformasi, if you dig the surface, they may have been rock fans as well. Um, I found a video on, uh, I think, like Utusa, Brita Harian online. Uh, the year that Yazid uh, Ahmad, the drummer mm -hmm. of Search, passed away in the 2020, and he was already doing dial dialysis. At the time, this was uh, 2019 before the Sheraton move, I think. Um, and Anwar Ibrahim had just won the Port Dixon Post, you know, he was, they were saying the Pakatan was still in government. And there's a video of him visiting Yazid Ahmad oh. in his home. And you, right. you see for a politician to, you, because they're such, uh, these rock icons are such powerful um, icons in the Malay community. The society, yes. They actually mobilize people politically as well. Or you know, politicians also have to pay their respects to these cultural yes. icons, yes. you know. Yes, in a way, unwillingly yeah. or willingly. Yeah, exactly. Or probably, he, you know. Actually, yeah. Anwar was very... It's interesting to see him meet uh, Yazid Ahmad because Anwar was part of ABIM, of the ABIM movement. In the when, 90s, yes, he started in it. In the 1980s and 1990s, which was... Which people read as being on the opposite end of Malay rock. Yeah. Uh, Malay rock culture. But I think... I don't think it's that simple. I think it was the... The UMNO government was projecting that divide more than, than anything. Yeah. Right, right. That's that's true. That's true. I, I, I agree to a certain extent. I see those traits. Um, okay, let's move on. What can the youth nowadays contribute to implement the spirit that music traits or the, the traits from the era of the 80s or 90s that you brought up in the talk? I man, I mean, like that's a really interesting question, but I would my first instinct is say why 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 80s and 90s? Do your own thing. You know, like yeah. Um, as a youth, do do something. That was the the uniqueness of that era is that new things were being formulated, uh, in you know new ways. Supposedly, very difficult now, right? Because yeah. we're so the, we have we're saturated in popular culture, uh, and our access to 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 both spatial and um, spatial and periodic, right? Like time. Um, exposures of art and music, you know, it's so easy to, to, to listen to a Led Zeppelin album and become a fan. It's so yeah. easy to become a fan of, of music from a different era and to define yourself that way. Within so that. I think we're heading into something completely, maybe different, maybe something completely inclusive uh, of different times and cultures and, you know, different times and spaces. Um, let me try to maybe read the question a bit from the perspective of the questioner, what can youth nowadays contribute to implement the spirit and music traits from the era of 80s and 90s? I think, I think what you're hinting at in the question is, is um, expression, right? So maybe it's like, uh, don't be afraid at the risk of being preachy where I'm not in a position to do this, you know, um, like express yourself what you want to express yourself lah. you know like this express right. what you want to express yes you know yes. without don't hold yourself back you know if you feel if you feel that you have to self-censor yourself for something 
Uh, maybe that's what you should be asking yourself. Because even Search and Wings were quite brave uh, in defiance to the state when it came to that long hair band. Um, yep. And I yep. would, I'm actually going, I'm planning to do a, a part two to this. <laughs> where right, I get right. that deeply. <laughs> I don't want to, I want to kind of give the teaser today and then right. draw you in for the next one. Um, so, but I think, I think, yeah, they, I think the musicians and people, uh, popular culture, people in the arts are very important also in defining society and also sometimes reminding people like, hey, it's okay to be different, right? That's kind of like what yes, exactly. tells you to, you know, that's yes. the real uh, message behind it. Message, that's true, love. that's true. Find yourself and be true to yourself. Yeah. Okay, um, we've got quite a few questions. We've got one from Jotsna here. Thank you, Adil, for a really oh, thought-provoking presentation. Can you talk about the role of the media in the dissemination of music these days as compared to in the 70s and 80s? So as someone who grew up watching RTM, I remember these bands and the music. Nowadays, however, I believe we are so segregated based on our, our viewership and listening choices. Mm. I mean, you have this, this paradox or conundrum, right? Where in that era, you have med a top-down control of media from the yep. state, where the state controls what everybody in Malaysia watches. But with that, you also have a greater sense of solidarity and cohesion amongst the Malaysian population because you're forced to watch the propaganda. You're yes. forced to watch the, the satya and the patriotic songs. But at the same time, it also speaks to you effectively and it gives you this sense of, of cohesion, right? Of being together as Malaysians. So right. then that was maybe the power of that media that we take for granted. But it's also, it is a, it's a paradox because with that also come like it tied to the, the previous question, people were also maybe less, you could hypothesize that people were less, were easily, obviously easily controlled, you know, like they to, to a certain script narrative or political indoctrination or ideology. And you see that in, you know, like results of elections and things like that, where you have strong, you know, I'm no BN wins, you know. So this, there's very little space for dissent when you have that government controlled media from that That's era. right. That's so right. now, of course, with a lot of the studies on Malaysian politics uh, paint the uh, 1998 post reformacy era as the new media era, you know. So not only are we thinking, we also have to think politically how that new media era gives birth to new kinds of popular culture expressions and icons. So for example, Name We is a very important popular music icon. Oh, yes. Uh, that, that really needs to be researched. <laughs> um, actually, he has been researched already, but from a more musical logic, like from more music. Yeah, rather than a political point of view. Yeah. But, you know, like, so, and he, he continues to do that. So I think Name We yeah. is a wonderful example of this alternative new media where it's come to a point where the, the, the non-mainstream media is more relevant than the mainstream media, obviously. Like, it's already yeah. quite obvious now. I think that's been the case uh, for a so while. That's, that's where we are. I mean, so in terms of Jotsna's question, I, I mean, um, yeah, if you feel a sense of longing, nostalgia for the past, that is actually part of, that is part of the propaganda, <laughs> that is part of the, the state mission of uh, inculcating that sense of Malaysianness. So you can read that as either, a, you know, a, a something that we look, that's something that will actually be mobilized a lot more by the state. And you are, in that question also, you are, you are playing that out, you know, like, uh, for example, it's like, oh, we were so much more united before. Yeah. And then now we're all segregated. But then I also pose the same question to you. I mean, now I can actually, we can actually have conversations like this on social media and not have it censored. You know, we can actually talk about uh, things that challenge this, the current state. Unfortunately, I think is that state, we, we, we have this kind of dissonance between the, the power, the, the, the saturation and diversity of popular media and the kind of different opinions with the old state that is still you know, running our country, the old way yeah. of thinking. We, like as young Malaysians, right, we are dealing with bosses or su supervisors or institutions, right? Like our universities, for example, that you, you see that they, they still have this old way of 
of functioning. Thinking, you know, there's the, the patronage politics, the clientelism, the yeah. don't ask questions, you know, listen to the, you know, and of course, if if you're a, a Malay culture, you say, oh no, tak baik, you have to, you, you have to respect, respect your elders. Your yeah. elders yes. Respect your elders, great, but you know, you, we also got to move forward, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's my point. Lah. That's true. I, I hope you, uh, I hope that question was answered, Jotna. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Um, can Rock Kapak's music evolve without abandoning its original musical traits? Uh, sorry, ask that question again. Can Rock, rock Kapak's can, music... Can the music of Rock Kapak of the 80s and 90s, can it actually evolve without abandoning its original music traits? Is there a possibility for that music to evolve into today's um, music scene without having... Um, it, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I, yeah. Ooh, okay, that one probably requires a whole other lecture, but <laughs> in a nutshell, the answer is yes, <laughs> and it has. <laughs> so it has already. In fact, um, it is already present in in Malay pop to the point that I think that the traits of uh, the question is which traits are we talking about? Is it the traits of deviancy and defiance, rebellion? Is it the traits of transgression or is it the traits of sentimentality and, mm. you know, um, effect and, and connections, you know, and the ballad? If, it's, if we're talking about the ballad, the aesthetics of the power ballad, then that is still playing out today in popular music to the point that it's not called rock anymore, but you will still hear the rock guitar solo. Yes. For the point in terms of like evolution or development, you see Malay, um, Malaysian and Malay rock bands today are definitely this kind of, I, I believe in, a, I, I prefer the word continuity, mm -hmm. a part of this continuity um, of the Malay rock era, you know. Um, but you also have, you know, where uh, cases where um, you have Malaysian musicians that are not listening to this music at all, yeah. you know, and yeah. who are playing rock. Who are not familiar so, with the, the origins of rock, but are claiming completely. to be playing rock. <laughs> But I think uh, don't be afraid. I mean, if you want to evolve it, I mean, like the sentimentality is important and the spirit of uh, difference and defiance, I think is the one that you have to carry forward. Okay. Um, I'm going to just merge a few questions here. Sure. Um, what is the difference between rock kapak's genre and urban music? Okay. Um, the, the common understanding of urban now is actually closer related to hip-hop and R&B culture, which mm -hmm. has strong roots in Afro-American uh, music. Um, and in terms of difference, not really, because <laughs> in fact, there's a, lot of there's a lot of connections as well between um, rock, heavy metal, and African-American urban music. Um, if you read Walser's book, uh, Running with the Devil, which talks about heavy metal in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, he mm. highlights that there are a lot of cases of crossover between heavy metal groups and, and uh, hip-hop rap groups. So heavy metal and hip-hop actually came up together around the same time. And they were both uh, musical pop music phenomenons. They both uh, dominated um, large shares of the listening market uh, globally. So... Um, of course, aesthetically, in terms of like sound, instrumentation, technologies that are used to produce the music, there is a vast difference. But um, the differences are not as stark as we see on the surface. There's a lot of symbiosis, I think. Happening, the yes. Genre, yes. The, between the, the two genres. It's because right, it's, it's a good question also because rock is also urban, right? Like rock is a very, it is. it's characterized right. by its urbanity. Uh, the same way that an urban music is just you know, it's just is urban. It's urban. Has, maybe it's just taken on that name, right? So it's a great question. So which requires us to look, I think, look, let's look at the connections between the two more than the differences, right? Yes, correct, correct. How do they both inform each other? Yeah. Um, I have one here. Do you foresee another music movement like the Malay rock happening in the future? Like, do you see... You see a phenomenon like rock kappa or the Malay rock. Well, I mean, honestly, like honestly, you gotta to listen to Nusantara hip hop right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, some is when you live in the era, you don't see it as a phenomenon, right? Even yes. the way it's that researched all, in retrospect, yeah, it, it's always this retrospective thing. Oh, it was a phenomenon, but search okay. were already in that 
on that high in their career where they could even proclaim that they were a phone phenomenon. Yes. It's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Uh, in the in the album title. Um, in terms of like you look closely at what's really what's actually kind of happening uh, in music right now. Um, the hip hop, like I mean, I listen to this uh, playlist on Spotify called Border Beats, mm-hmm. and that's like right. I mean, uh, I mean, Doctor Pravina is the expert on hip hop here in Malaysia. Okay. So, so and then and look at. I mean, I think we got to think more about the transnational. I talk about cross regional. Like especially in South in in Indian Malaysian uh, Malaysian Indian uh, hip hop music, the transnational aspect of of uh, music is very important. You don't a lot of Malaysians don't know how much of an impact Malaysian hip hop artists have As on South Asia, overseas, yes, right overseas, exactly. which I which I know that you you're working on like research. Yep. So yep. so that I mean let's let's look at it's already happening, you know. Um, in fact, it already probably has been happening. For example, even uh, in the Chinese popular music scene in Malaysia, a lot of the top, you know, there are a lot of Malaysian uh, artists that are huge in in Chinese speaking. Hong Kong countries. and Taiwan, yes. Hong Kong, Taiwan, and also in China, and yes. of course you got phenomenons like Sheila, Sheila Hamza, you know, the yes. Malay women who sing. Making uh, it big. Mandarin. You've got the phenomenon of uh, Yuna, who has broken into the. The, the UK US top market top, yes. through R&B, and she started off as a folk singer, then she became R&B and urbanized herself. Uh, and then you've got even artists that people kind of overlook, like ZRV, who started mm. already started breaking those barriers. So um, I think that's I think that's what you mean. Um, the question is, what's the next thing? I can't tell you. I I research the past, you know. So <laughs> and I try my best to observe the present. Even then, I'm slow, you know. So. <laughs> But I, uh, yeah, let's. I would say have a look at what's already been happening. Also, yes, yeah. yes. Um, I think I will give you one last question before we wrap up. Um, awesome. Let's see. Do you want to pick one of the questions that you have? That okay, rather than yeah, I sure. visit you, maybe you Anything take the on last Facebook? question. Uh, I can't see uh, the, the feed. Uh, neither can I. Let me just. Like some of these questions, um. I kind of answered in the talk, like yes. subgenres of rock. I kind of went through the glam metal and the trash metal kind of genres and that combination. In terms of of rock up up becoming worldwide music, okay, maybe I'll answer this one. Mm-hmm. Um, um, unfortunately, no, <laughs> because the barrier remains uh, that English, uh, the, the barrier of of the Malay language also remains. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas bands like Japanese bands like The Loudness managed to break into that market, and they also yep. managed to market on their exoticism of being different and Asian and sounding like you guys, like sounding like white people, uh, and then, uh, but Malay rock the most the furthest that search went I can tell you was they were invited to New York, to a music exhibition in New York in 1991. Ah. Uh, it's a big music expo, and they performed uh, in a they perform in a club, uh, in New York. And they were even sponsored by Tourism Malaysia at the time, and uh, wow. Mass to travel there. And so that was the biggest foray. They were trying to break into Japan, but I think it didn't pan out. Yeah, so much. Um, and they tried to do English songs, but there was one English song in Rampage, but I don't think that that turned out very well. Um, I think, but I think the the continuity of of um, Malay rock. In in the pop in Malaysian popular artists that have become world famous, for example, like you, uh, ZRV and Yuna, it's part of this continuity of Malaysia's um, ability to really express Western Anglo American, Afro American, Anglo American music in a yeah. very authentic way. Yeah, because like, I mean, look at us, Pravina. We're both speaking English, right? Right now in this talk, so. Um, because of our colonial history and our post-colonial development as well, and the kind of the the position of Malaysia in the world where it was this kind of receptacle of of Anglo-American, African forms of influences, yeah. And we kind of we found a way to adapt to it. I think that's what attracted Indonesians to the Malay rock phenomenon is because Indonesia has very strong um tri- uh, sense of tradi- or local traditions yeah yes, and folk traditions that's right. that's right and i think malay rock were like whoa they're like they're so western but yes. they speak our language yes. 
it's the uh, same so, thing with the the Tamil hip hop that you were saying, like the hip hop musicians. It's the same thing. They did not do as well in Malaysia, but in India, people like A R Rahman, who is an Oscar, uh, um, mm-hmm. is an Oscar winner yeah. actually. Yeah. But he picked up Tamil hip hop musicians from Malaysia to be featured in Indian cinema, and these mm-hmm. musicians were not doing as well locally. But what actually attracted was exactly what you said. It's that whole influence and the way English is spoken and the way the identity of a hip hop musician is projected. Yeah. It's something that the local Indians, like the Indonesians, did not have. Ah, so they had a very kind of Indian image. It's a very straight mm-hmm. Indian image, and that's the same with the Indonesian rockers. It was a very, um, I don't know, it was I don't yeah. know whether the word stereotype is right, but they had something that Malaysians. <laughs> They did not have something that Malaysians mm. had. So Malaysian had this whole amalgamation of the Malay, Chinese, Indian kind of exactly, melting yeah. pot. Is the multicultural? Um, yeah. I mean, there's there's a few like jargon words that we can use, like cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Sui Bing, uh, Tan, Prof Tan Sui Bing uses the term. I mean, she plays with the word vernacular cosmopolitanism vernacular, yes. that goes all the way back to the 1900s, right? In how we've adapted. This region, especially, has adapted to the music, um, and I think that I, I think in Indonesia now they they also have that, <laughs> you know. Uh, in Malaysia, I mean, we also a lot of Malaysian musicians are used as sessionists for the Chinese touring scene, the touring touring circuit, also because of this supposed the fact that apparently we play like like from like we're from the states, or yes. we sound like we're from the states, we speak or we can that. You know, yeah. speak differently. Um, we can put this. We can put that slang and all the swagger. Yes, you know, yes, that's right. Um, but at the same time, it's us. It's but that- I, I like that idea. I, I, I like that idea also about it is this kind of um, the diversity, the specific kind of diversity and post-colonial diversity or experience of the Malaysian experience that also lends to that gives it its uniqueness. Yeah, that that gives yep. that uniqueness. Yep. That's a great yep. question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Adil. Um, we had, wow, it's going to be almost two hours. But All right. Thank you. I mean, so I hope clear, everyone at uh, home is enjoying it. Uh, yeah. Thank <laughs> you so much, Dr. Pravina and Dr. Sarina no for problem. having me. Um, hope we can have more. And I hope also uh, Kita Institute of Ethnic Studies is more than happy to also invite you. It will be uh, great. Yes. A series of sure. talks that we're planning as well. So we'll That'll get in touch we'll, about that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sarina is back. Yeah. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you share um, the music that the music students, we have classes, but not so much ingrained in popular music. And it's nice that they have such um, talks as in, uh, I must thank Dr. Sarina for insisting that we continue to have these research in discourses with academics for them to share their work so that it's not just a performance-based platform or program, but it's more, you know, thinking and starting to get those brain cells working a little bit more. That's great. Thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, Dr. Sarina, do you want to say a few words? Thank you very much, Dr. Adil, and also Dr. Pravina for moderating. I really enjoyed the session, the talk and all that. And um, I have two comments, basically. Basically, um, I don't know if Dr. Dr. Adil remembers that. Basically, based on my field, I'm an Mm. art historian, Mm -hmm. right? So the cover of Rampage, it's mm. actually a sculpture done by Bayu Utomo Rajki. Yeah. Yeah. So when I saw that 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 cover, I was like, this is Bayu Utomo's work. <laughs> this is a, so the, 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 the 1982, the 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 rampage uh, cover. The rampage cover. So this is the patong. This is the this is the actual sculpture. Yeah. And this is yeah. the the front cover. Yes. And he's credited. Uh, Bayu Bayu Utomo Rajikin is is. Ah, so you have it with you. Credited as well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so then th- that's kind of connection between the arts and also the music. Yeah. And also the second point is that I think this whole I mean um you know for the younger students and all that um probably this is something new to them in a sense as you were having side conversations yeah Dr Pravina, but I think this is um. For, for us at this age, this is sort of a reminiscent of yes. <laughs> me, me growing up because I have three brothers and mm-hmm. my the second brother was like into rock. And, mm. you know, I I became the witness of this whole demonization of rock because he had long uh. hair and all that. <laughs> so 
daughter was really like your thing, like your your mom and your your brother yeah. was like into bickering and the stuff tension, like that. Yeah. So that's another side story to it. It's <laughs> an important, very important story. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I'm not gonna hold you off any longer. You have spent so much time with us, but I'm sure the audience on Arts Just and Facebook has enjoyed this. We have uh, you know, a lot of comments and a lot of people sharing. So for those who are watching right now, please like and share our current um video, okay, to your own stream, to your own um, you know, Facebook. And uh please um I think like Dr. Pravinda always insists that like you know, you know, her students to sort of like give give a claps um I, emojis on the on yeah. the you know the chat give me chat give box. me some uh, rock on emojis <laughs> there you go it's <laughs> more appropriate <laughs> So uh, for um, if you uh, for USM students and also staff, if you see in the chat uh, in the you know Facebook chat, there is a link for registration. Uh, please register uh, yourself there. And um, I think that uh, basically this is it. Thank you so much uh, for being here, uh, spending almost two hours with us, Dr. Adil. And we hope Sorry. that um, you know School of the uh, School of the Arts hope that we can continue this collaboration and this network and engagement you know after this thank All you right. so much thank you thank you so much thank you thank Salam you very Santara. much <laughs> okay. thanks Dr. Zarina. okay thank you everyone for tuning in until the next research in bye